I'm going to ask our next speaker to come up and get set up. But while he's getting set up, Jamie, will you come and stand with me? Because you know this guy, I think, a little bit. You know, we've hung around, yeah. Yeah, you hung around. I mean, he hardly needs an introduction, right? I mean, he's, he, how many of you went to law school in part because of Larry Lessig? <laughs> right? Oh, one. Well, thank you. Two. Okay, good, Larry. You got two. We know him to be the founder of the creative Commons, a Harvard Law professor. He, he ran for president. Would that he had won. But you know the, the, the inner workings of Larry Lessig. Tell us a little bit about that, Larry Lessig. I want you to know. She insisted I do this. Um, <laughs> Larry. I'm saying this to Larry. Um, Larry's one of the most amazing people I've ever met because he has a reality distortion field, which lots of people have, but his works. So in setting up Creative Commons, Larry would repeatedly say to us, look, we'll just run out over the stage above the pews to the back. And we go, but we'll fall. And Larry goes, no, it'll be fine if we, if we run fast. And we would go, I don't think that, go, no, trust me, it'll work. And it did. Um, I'll tell you one story and then and we'll let Larry talk. There was, um, when, when Creative Commons started, I wanted to have a single license that applied everywhere in the world, just like the GPL. And Larry said, no, we'll have a license for every country in the world. And I said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my entire life. Microsoft couldn't do that. Google you know, was barely in existence. Google couldn't do that. IBM couldn't do that. You'd need the best lawyers in every country in the world to adapt these licenses, not just to their language, but to their legal system. And their legal systems are wildly different. This is a crazy idea. I was objectively correct. right? He had invited me to run across in open air. And he said, no, it'll work, trust me. And what happened was, we went to all of these lawyers, these amazing people, these artists in other countries, and said, hey, we have a problem. They said, we got you. And suddenly, we had hundreds of thousands of unpaid volunteers around the world who wanted to solve our problem, which he had created, by the way, by not having a single license. And they were all really excited about Creative Commons. I was right. It was an incredibly stupid idea that succeeded magnificently. Yes. Thank you. And that's, so, I think that's more I've, than enough story. So all of you will have questions for Larry Lessig. There are cards in the pews and pens. If you would write down your question very legibly, there will be people going around to collect them, and we'll bring them up to him. So without further ado, thank you, Jamie. Please welcome Professor Larry Lessig. Thank you. So it is wonderful to be here today to celebrate the extraordinary gift that the law has allowed us to have our culture back. But it is way too long that we have been waiting for this moment. It is wonderful that this work now enters the public domain. In an old day, we would have said, we can now rip, mix, and burn this work. We should celebrate, we should share, we should build upon, we should now preserve these things that have been given back to us. But it is fucking absurd. <laughs> That's a technical legal term. It's fucking absurd that it took 20 years to get here. And I think what we have to do is learn a bit. It's good what we can learn. I don't mean the things that we will learn are good things. I just mean it's good that we have learned something from these 20 years. So let's think back to then. There was a man who was our president then, you might remember, one score and 90 years ago today, this man signed into law this statute, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. This statute had been fought by many extraordinary people, some who are not here, Dennis Cariala, who was an extraordinary law professor who did everything he could to stop this statute, some of whom are here, Pam Samuelson, who did everything she could to stop this statute, but they lost, which means we lost. Congress put a pause on the public domain. 
And then I read a story about a man who said hell with that, Eric Eldred, who said, I want to publish this works despite the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. I'm going to put Robert Frost's poems up on the internet. I don't care about the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. And I went to Eric and I said, Eric, Eric, let us challenge this statute in your name. Let us go to the Supreme Court and say to the Supreme Court, look, Congress has a power, but it's a limited power. And that court, I said, Eric, is filled with people who believe in interpreting the Constitution according to the framers' vision, and they will give you a victory. Eric, you don't have to threaten yourself with prosecution. So he said yes, and we took this case to the Supreme Court, and of course, we lost, or I lost. I lost some faith. Faith in the good faith of those who had said so often before that they were committed to an idea regardless of the politics. The idea, this constitution, that these conservatives said would be read according to our framers. These conservatives in that case of Eldred versus Ashcroft sat silently as those who didn't believe in reading the Constitution according to the framers vision, Justice Ginsburg, and then the dissenters, Justice Stevens and Justice Breyer, fought out the stupidity of this extension, this pause on the public domain. That was an incredible loss. But you know, from that loss, an extraordinary amount of good came so many people were pissed off <laughs> after that loss. <laughs> so many people were so angry at this freedom not given that they began to say this freedom needs to be taken, taken back. It's from that loss that Creative Commons was born. It's from that loss that these extraordinary organizations began to build what is the movement, the free culture of movement that today celebrates the fight to make this work and freedom universal. Maybe never would that movement have taken off if we had won. Maybe. Now, one of the soldiers in that movement, one of the inspirations in that movement was a boy named Aaron Swartz. He was there at the very beginning. So, uh, who are you and why are you here at the Eldred argument? Doesn't make sense. I am Eric Swartz and I'm here to listen to the Eldred, to see the Eldred argument. Why did you fly out? And he was at the beginning of- Now that you've seen the theory of Creative Commons, it's time to show you some of the practice. So when you come to, your, come to our website here, and you go to choose license, it gives you this list of options, it explains what it means, and then after Creative Commons, he came to work with Brewster to build the Open Library Project. He was a soldier in the fight for free culture. And then about 2010, he decided he wanted to move on. He decided that he wanted to move to the fight for a more progressive politics. So he stopped his work on free culture. He started an organization called Demand Progress. That organization began to fight with who he thought would be a progressive president, a man named Barack Obama, and to think that through this progressive president we could get policies that he thought the nation needed, healthcare policies and policies about global warming. But in uh, September of 2010, Aaron got an email. Here, I'll let him tell so you that me, story. It all started with a phone call. It was September not last year, but the year before that, September 2010. And I got a phone call from my friend Peter. Aaron, he said, there's an amazing bill that you have to take a look at. Well, what is it, I said. It's called COICA, the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeiting Act. Oh, Peter, I said, I don't care about copyright law. Maybe you're right, maybe Hollywood is right, but either way, what's the big deal? 
I'm not going to waste my life fighting over a little issue like copyright, health care, financial reform. Those are the issues that I work on. Not something obscure like copyright law. Now, you can imagine Aaron feeling as he was getting this email something like uh, maybe this. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. And he wrote me an email, and he said that he was planning this fight against Koika, uh, and he wanted me to join him, and I had a similar reaction to that. Every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. So he said, is there anything that, he could, that I could do to help him with Koika? And I wrote back, uh, Koika, is that a virus? And he responded, the internet censorship bill, close enough. But what he did was to fight this bill, the Koika uh, bill, because this statute had this extraordinary ability to make the Constitution disappear. What this statute promised was that the Attorney General could, without any due process, take down websites because there was an allegation of copyright infringement. And so what Demand Progress did was to organize this fight against the copyright uh, um, uh, and in the Judiciary Committee, they succeeded in stopping the bill, and it never went to the Senate floor. That was a pretty incredible victory. <laughs> but then, of course, like Jason in Friday the 13th, it came back, and it came back in the form of something called SOPA, or PIPA which was a new version of this same bad idea, and it triggered another new movement to fight it. And leaders such as Senator Wyden began to push hard to get this bill stopped in Congress. And as they moved to build the movement, they moved without believing they would ever win. This is an important point. They didn't believe they would win, they just knew the fight was right. So they took it up, believing there was no chance because almost 65 senators had signed a letter saying they were supporting Koika, and then Pippa, and then Sopa. It seemed impossible to imagine Congress pulling back from that, but the fact it was impossible didn't mean it was not something they should fight for, so they fought. And slowly, they built support all across the internet. And then that support grew dramatically. And organizations like Wikipedia and Reddit uh, began to join the fight and threaten to shut down the internet if they didn't stop SOPA and PIPA. And then they did stop SOPA and PIPA for an even more incredible victory. Here's. Aaron describing that, that victory. Hard as it was for me to believe, after all this, we had won. The thing that everyone said was impossible, that some of the biggest companies in the world had written off as kind of a pipe dream, had it happened. We did it. We won. And then we started rubbing it in. <laughs> you all know what happened next. Wikipedia went black. Reddit went black. Craigslist went black. The phone lines on Capitol Hill flat out melted. Members of Congress started rushing to issue statements, retracting their support for the bill that they were promoting just a couple days ago. It was just ridiculous. I mean, th there's a chart from the time that captures it pretty well. It says something like, January 14th on one side, and it has this big, long list of names supporting the bill, and then just a few lonely people opposing it. And then on the other side, it says January 15th, and now it's totally reversed. Everyone is opposing it. Just a few lonely names still hanging on in support. I mean, this really was unprecedented. Don't take my word for it, but ask former Senator Chris Dodd, now the chief lobbyist for Hollywood. He admitted after he lost that he had masterminded the whole evil plan. And he told the New York Times he'd never seen anything like it during his many years in Congress. And everyone I've spoken to agrees. The people rose up and they caused a sea change in Washington. Not the press, which refused to cover the story. Just coincidentally, their parent companies all happened to be lobbying for the bill. Not the politicians, who were pretty much unanimously in favor of it. And not the companies who had all but given up trying to stop it and decided it was inevitable. It was really stopped by the people. 
This was a victory that was an inspiring victory for him. It changed his whole view of what he would do. It was from this moment that he was convinced everything in the rest of his life would be committed to the politics of rallying people to fight these, for these changes. And the lesson he took from this was not just about copyright, as Wyden said in response to, after this victory, what we've seen in the last few weeks from the grassroots is a time for the history books. The win is a triumph over very powerful special interests. That triumph produced a recognition that there was a more fundamental issue here, and that issue was the basic corruption of our political process. Now, Aaron had triggered me on that corruption about five years before. Aaron came to visit me when I was writing what would be the last book I would write about copyright, a book called Remix. And I was excited to share with him the book. I was about to give my first TED talk about copyright, and I was excited to talk to him about that. And he was not excited at all <laughs> about the book or the TED talk. And he said to me, how do you ever think you're going to make progress on these issues so long as there's this basic corruption in our government? And, you know, I was kind of miffed. I wanted him to be excited with me about these exciting things that I was working on. I thought we were making real progress, but I pushed back. I said to him, you know, Aaron, it's not my field. Not my field, corruption. My field is internet, culture, and copyright. And he said, you mean, as an academic, it's not your field? And I said, yeah, Aaron, as an academic, it's not my field. And he said, well, what about as a citizen? Is it your field as a citizen? And this was the way he was. His questions could hug like a mother's hug and pull a recognition however hard you wanted to deny it. And of course, from that recognition at that moment, he and I agreed that he and I would join and we would work on this corruption problem together and I would give up the work I was doing on copyright. And from that moment in 2006, I had shifted my field to this field I now pursue here. But Aaron's work as a citizen was different. Shortly after that, Aaron was speaking at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and this is what he said. Everything up to now, all of those journals, all that scientific legacy going back to the Enlightenment, that's still behind locked gates. But you, you have a key to those gates. And with a little bit of shell script magic, you can get those journal articles. You can download copies of them. And once you have a copy, theoretically, you could make it available to everyone. And if you don't know how to make it available to everyone without getting caught, you can go to guerrillaopenaccess.com and find my mailing address. And hard drives that get sent there will find their way online. So Eric's obsession, Aaron's obsession began to focus on JSTOR. And he was focused on JSTOR obsessively because he had attended a conference in Budapest at which the question was asked, how much would it cost to liberate the JSTOR database? JSTOR, if you might not know, is a database of academic scholarship, an extraordinary resource of scholarship that had been published over hundreds of years, but collected and made accessible mainly to relatively wealthy Americans in American universities. And the idea that Aaron had in this question was, how do we make it available to everybody? What would it take? How much would it cost? And the answer was given a quarter of a billion dollars. <laughs> And that infuriated Aaron. 
And so shortly thereafter, he went to this university, building 16, and began to suck the JSTOR database down onto hard drives, ostensibly to make it available to others after he had collected the whole of the archive. He was arrested. Our government charged him with ultimately multiple felonies, all charging unauthorized access to this database. The US attorney proud to brag that she was threatening 34 years in prison for his downloading too many academic articles. Now, what was bizarre about this prosecution was that Aaron was on MIT's property. And MIT had something called the open access policy for its networks. So though he was being charged with unauthorized access to the network, MIT's policy was everybody had free access to the network. And so this system, which allowed anybody access, mean to, seemed to mean that it was possible that his unauthorized access was, in fact, authorized. And then as a study by the MIT University Council's office afterward concluded, even though he was technically authorized, the government never asked MIT whether he had been authorized. They never asked before they prosecuted him. And MIT didn't ask of itself whether he was authorized. So here, a prosecution of Aaron for his access authorized by the MIT policy was never questioned by the state or the university. Well, that gave his team, his legal team, hope. His lawyer told me he was optimistic that Aaron would not be convicted. But two years into this litigation, having spent all of his savings on the litigation, Aaron was not optimistic about the litigation. And six years and 14 days ago today, he ended his life. He left us. Shortly thereafter, it was discovered that the $250 million estimate to liberate JSTOR had been a mistake, a misunderstanding. That in fact, JSTOR would liberate its archive for a fraction of that, and of course, right now, has basically done that. Okay, I have one more thought before I stop. So in the days before Aaron steered me away from working on copyright, I was working to complete this book remix, and when I would go around talking about this book remix, I would tell a story that was inspired by a certain remix. So many of you are familiar with this remix. You know the great movie, The Breakfast Club. You know the music of Listomania, of Phoenix, called Listomania. Somebody got the great idea, what if we remix these two together? They produce this. So okay, and so it's the nature of the internet, is the nature of what this frame had created, we saw from this creativity a kind of call and then response. So first in Brooklyn. So sentimental. And then San Francisco. Come, San Francisco. So 
saw literally scores of these remixes spreading across YouTube. Amsterdam, Manila, Rio, I don't know what Cousins is, but anyway. The point is, everywhere, people were mimicking this creativity, this call and response in the spirit of remix. And I was going around the world talking about it, as I just have here with you. And then the fucking band Phoenix sued me. <laughs> no, seriously. They threatened to sue me because my videos used their music to talk about the way their music was being remixed by people all around the world. So I said, hell no. I called my friends at EFF, and we filed a countersuit against <laughs> the band. And very quickly. <laughs> the lawsuit was over. It was a victory. It was an important victory that we had, that they had made against this extremism. But of course, what we need to recognize is that not all people threatened in this context, in this way, have such victories. Not all enjoy the extraordinary legal support of a group like EFF. Of course, YouTube is littered with channels that have been shut down through copyright strikes, three strikes and you're out. People who've created and tried to make their creativity available and this constant fight by the copyright owners to restrict the freedom to create and remix has its effect. Many of us want to win and move on from these fights. The point is, they never move on. They stay. And they persist in their insistence that the picture of culture that we celebrate is the picture that they will stop. And that means our strategy here, I think, has got to be to learn a bit from the works of J.K. Rowling. Now, I, I cleared the permission to quote here, so don't worry, there won't be any force used when I do this. But you remember at the end of book six, this quote, it was important, Dumbledore said, to fight and fight again and keep fighting, for only then could evil be kept at bay, though never quite eradicated. That is what we must do. We must fight, yes, and fight, and fight again. Because the reality is that we are on the right side of history here, my friends. And never have I been more sure of that when, than when this whole little episode of Listomania was reminded to the culture we live in, when it appeared in this form with these creators. Because, of course, this extraordinary so woman was one of the people who I had seen so many times as I had told that story. And as we reflect on what that means, that one of the most powerful political leaders of the next 30 years is a woman who in her bones understands exactly what we have been fighting for. Some of us for 30 years, Pam Samuelson, for 30 years fighting for this cause. What we know is that what we know is true is increasingly becoming obvious and not just among people like us, but obvious everywhere. And the thing we need to worry about most is that 20 years from now, when somebody suggests we have another celebration of the Internet Archive to remember those days when we were fighting for the public domain, people will say, huh? Really? You had to fight for the public domain? And when that time comes, let me tell you, it will be wonderful again. But it is still true, it has taken way too long. 
I am so grateful to the work that everybody here has done and the fights that all of us have been engaged in will be fights we will celebrate for the rest of our lives as the obviousness becomes unavoidable. And the work that's been done here at this archive by the people here who celebrate the 20, 20th anniversary of the pause being placed by celebrating the future, well, there will never be a pause on the public domain again. That work is inspirational to all of us. Thank you so much for what you've done and for the celebration you engaged today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brewster. Thank you. Larry, Larry, we have some questions from the audience. Okay, I have answers. Dear Lawrence, how do we proceed with global copyright reform for the benefit of humanity? Well, the truth is that it only happens if we stop the United States from being the most forceful force for oppression in this battle. You know, there are many people around the world who would like to unite in the fight to create a more reasonable, balanced system of copyright. Some places completely surprising. I was in Russia. <laughs> There's an extraordinary movement in Russia of people trying to build another version of copyright that is more balanced and sensible than the one the United States interests push so hard. So the fight has to begin at home because we have the most power in this fight. And if we can get our government to become more sensible, then we can begin to prevail in that fight. And we only get our government to be more sensible if we find a way to restrain the power of special interest in our government, which is the fight Aaron started me on more than 12 years ago. But I'm optimistic, because I'm pretty sure people like AOC will be at the center of that fight, that the idea of creating a copyright act as a more balanced, open project is something that will become more and more obvious to all in our government if we can at least get through this crisis. So there is a movement outside of the United States. We should enable it by fixing the damage that we're doing here in the United States. Here's a question from Ron. Is it possible to turn the clock back and reduce copyright terms? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's conceivable we could reduce copyright terms going forward, not immediately, but if we get to a place where it makes more, more responsive, more responsive to sensible copyright policy, it's possible to think about reducing it going forward. But those who have the rights right now do everything they can to defend what they now have. And we still don't have, in the United States government at least, any recognition of why that needs to be balanced with this conception of the public good. So it's possible, but it's something that, again, takes what I was told we had to do first, which is to fix our government. Here's another question. Larry, how do we deal with the competing forces of freedom of speech and free access versus personal property, political correctness, and privacy? Well, it's a really hard thing to get people to recognize how these are really very different fights. So I'm a big believer in the value of the First Amendment's free speech clause in understanding why we need to restrict the protections of copyright where they're doing no good, as Jamie was describing before, in the context where the only thing it's doing is restricting access without producing any good in, in, a, in an alternative. So I think the First Amendment's done real good there. But we need to recognize the First Amendment's also being used by corporations 
to restrict the ability of governments to regulate, to advance things even like privacy or network neutrality. One of the strong arguments made by cable companies is that network neutrality violates their First Amendment rights because it's forcing them to carry content they don't want to carry. Or in the context of privacy, First Amendment's banning our ability to regulate in the context of privacy because it's forcing companies to engage in the control of speech that they otherwise don't want to be engaged in. So this very same tool that is for the good also can be used for the bad. That there's this Janus face character of the First Amendment, like there's a Janus face character to the internet itself. So I think that the fight has got to be to separate these fights, to recognize the free speech fight for access to culture is a different fight from the questions of privacy. I think we need both privacy and these free speech rights, but getting there is going to take an extraordinary amount of work. Basically, the EFF needs about 10 times the budget it has right now, so if you want to give to the EFF right now, that would be really helpful. <laughs> We're in Silicon Valley, so we have a couple of technical questions for you. Do you um, think that blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum will help with the future of uncensorable data? Um, boy, there's so much in that. Um, so I think there's a natural way, there's a natural story, a natural progression here of the spread of blockchain technologies. Um, not just in the context of like bit, Bitcoin, but also in the more generic context that Ethereum is pushing towards where we imagine infrastructures of automatic enforcement, automatic law through code. You might say code is law. That might be a way to characterize that future. <laughs> and, and that struggle, that struggle to regulate that code is something governments are going to be keenly focused on because the world where technology automatically enforces the rules contrary to the policies of the government is not a world the governments are going to accept very easily or very uh, openly. So I, I do think that there is a natural way in which this future is unfolding and we should expect this to be an increasingly important part. But as I listen to the debates around the blockchain, it feels like deja vu all over again. Right? Because the blockchain is the blockchain movement is filled with so many people who believe, boy, this will be the beautiful, perfect world where technology gives us our freedom. We aren't controlled or regulated by the government. It's like John Perry Barlow has returned in the debates around the blockchain. It's the same debate we were having 25 years ago around the internet. As people imagine the internet as a technology that would be a perfect libertarian space that would save us from the control of government. And what many were saying back then is what some are saying now about the blockchain. What many were saying back then was, look, you're never going to have a space that the government yields control over completely. And if you imagine you're going to build it without the government, they're going to come in and they're going to crudely and powerfully crush much of the hope and the potential and the freedom that this space could give you. And so that's the same truth with blockchain. It's not going to be a space that's unregulated. So we got to figure out how is it going to be that the freedom and potential of blockchain that can, can develop recognizing that this requirement will continue, the government's insistence that it has a role to play here will continue. Professor Lessig, do you think that courts will ultimately rule that APIs are copyrightable? I have so much faith in Pam. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I mean, no, I don't. I mean, I think that she will win. And I think she will win in part because, you know, the funny thing is though the courts have given us a bunch of really terrible decisions. It's also true the courts have given us a bunch of incredible progress around the ideas of fair use. There's some Second Circuit's still screwy in all sorts of ways, but if you think about, if you think about the Google Book case, you know, the, book, the Google Books case, which developed after 
Brewster had made, um, <coughs> begun to make the um, same technology available through the Internet Archive. When that happened, based on the existing law at the time, most people were really skeptical that the courts would ever recognize a fair use right to do what Google Books eventually enabled, which was the snippet search. And, and if you compare the decision that ultimately decided that this use was fair use with the decisions of courts even just five years before, you could see that there had been progress in the courts. The courts had increasingly understood the importance of the other side. Part of that was because courts are not subject to the copyright lobbies. They don't live, they don't depend on the money from Hollywood, so they're free to make a decision on the basis of what makes sense, not what pays for the campaign. So that's one reason why they can get it right. They also are filled with clerks who are taught by people like Jennifer and Jamie and Pam who have, who have learned the other side and then go to those judges and tell them, look, there's more to this story than just the copyright owners who need to be protected. So that progress is possible in courts in the way that still in the legislature, they don't even see the other side because they're paid not to see. So I, I, they, I, have, I have hope that in the courts, this balance will be struck. And uh, if it can happen there, then that becomes the foothold that we can fight in the legislature uh, more generally. Can you speak to the European GDPR and its impact on US laws? Yeah, so, so the GDPR, you know, is that statute which achieved that really important objective of making sure that whenever you go to a website, you have to click, yes, I know what cookies are, and I'm okay with the cookies. Right, I mean, so on the one hand, I'm all for figuring out how we can better protect privacy. But on the other hand, there are stupid ways to protect privacy, and there are less stupid ways to protect privacy. And forcing us to go through this ritual that says, yay, yeah, yeah, I've read the cookies and uh, the cookie policy and I'm okay with it, doesn't, in my view, help us protect privacy. What it does is convince people that there's a whole bunch of uses here that they don't really understand and that's just the way the world is. I think we have to be more open to the idea that privacy is not going to be protected by creating the, 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 the fantasy that individuals are gonna choose the right set of protections and protect themselves against the wrong set of protections. Instead, privacy is gonna be protected when governments start saying, here's legitimate uses and here are illegitimate uses. And the space between, we might have to try to get people's affir affirmation before their data can be used in that way. I think what's bizarre in this space is that we believe that if we just give individuals choice, the right answer will be created. But, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't know anything about really what these policies are saying because I don't, frankly, have the time to read them. So when you say to me, have I agreed to your policy, and I say, yes, let me tell you, I'm lying to you. <laughs> and you're lying to me, and you're lying to everybody. We're all lying. We're all living this lie, this constant perpetual lie. We experience, we go through our life lying all the time. You know, there was a time when you didn't have to do that. I, I kind of remember a time where I, you could go through life and do what you needed to do without constantly engaging in this ritual of lying. Um, and, and, and that's the reality that this method, this way of thinking about privacy has produced, and I just think we need to get beyond it. We need to be open about saying, it's going to be hard to figure out which uses should not be permitted and which uses should clearly be permitted, and which uses we should try to figure out whether somebody has really opted into. That's going to be a hard thing to figure out. I get it. But unless we start doing that, unless we start putting some things off the table and some things that are easy so we can narrow those places where we need people to affirm them, we're going to live in this space where there is no real protection, and that lack of real protection will really matter as our data becomes this commodity that defines us, that sells us, as we try to live in the context of the internet. I think I've got one more question. That's the only one I'm going to answer. So you got one more? One more? That's it. Are you planning to run for president oh, in 2020? <laughs> 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 
So the answer is, I am planning to do whatever the fuck I can to get us a government that actually represents us. That's what I'm planning on doing. But right now, I'll tell you, I'm free from the burden of running for president, and that's the way I hope things remain. But thank you so much for everything you've done, Brewster and Pam and Jamie and everybody who's organized this, including Creative Commons that Jamie, we started. I didn't start Creative Commons. And uh, this is an extraordinary celebration. I'm so happy to watch with all of us as this develops across the day. Thank you. Let's hear it for Larry Lessig. I hear him.